establish a new task force. Uh, this task force was mainly dedicated to emerging technologies uh, and some innovations in neurosurgery, ETIN task force. Uh, as you know, the task force is one of the main instruments of the European Associ Association of Neurosurgical Society to focus on certain topics that are important for the community. And we have been very glad that um, innovations and emerging technologies has become such a focus and such an important topic for the European Association. Uh, <clears throat> the founding member of this um, task force have been uh, five people. Uh, these are uh, Enrico Tessitore, uh, Nicolas Sempron, Marcel Ivanov and Florian Ringel. I will give them the uh, to say a few words in a moment. But before all, because uh, the main reason for establishing this task force is the board of the European Associ Association of Neurosurgical Societies, um, uh, I am very glad and very thankful that uh, the president of the ENS, uh, Dr. Andreas Demetriades, is uh, amongst us. And I will be uh, thankful for if he uh, say a few words and he give a small welcome address. Andreas. Thank you, Nikolai. So good, uh, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure on behalf of the ENS board and uh, myself personally to congratulate, first of all, the founding members of the new task force for the ENS. And of course, to welcome all the participants. We've had more than 360 registrations for this webinar, which clearly shows that there is a lot of appropriate appetite for the topic. Our specialty is very much uh, aligned with emerging technologies and innovation, and therefore this new task force will hopefully uh, engage and inspire a lot of us in uh, the future. And we look forward to more activities, more educational platforms, and in fact, more innovations. So thank you to all of the founding members. And just to explain that the, the board is happy to accept uh, proposals and, and suggestions, and we do our best to, to facilitate uh, as much as we can. But I'm looking forward to this. So thank you again, Nikolai, for organizing it. And thank you and welcome to our guest, Professor Kazabov. Uh, Enjoy the evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely right that one of the main purposes uh, of um, this task force is to bring on the same table people from different area of knowledge. And um, we want to, to bring on the same table of neurosurgeons, engineers, scientists, people that are familiar with artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and this is one of the reasons why our first guest is Professor Kasabov, and the topic will be neuroinformatics, neural networks, neurocomputers, and some application in neurosurgery. But before starting with um, the speech of Professor Kasabov, I would like to, to ask some of the founding members of the ETIN uh, what, why they, they decided to become part of, of this um, initiative. Enrico, probably you first. Hello, hello, everybody. Present yourself. Um, hello, thanks a lot, Nicole. I am, uh, um, I'm Enrico Tessitore. I'm a neurosurgeon working at Geneva University Hospital in, in Switzerland. And I must say, like um, any neurosurgeon, I've always been very fascinated by technology. And uh, I must say that our profession has dramatically changed in the last decades, forcing us to develop skills going well beyond the um, surgical procedure itself. And we are often confronted with uh, the use of technological tools uh, that require specific and proper handling. Uh, but there is no doubt that this technology uh, has made neurosurgery uh, much safer and more precise. Today, I think that our uh, neurosurgical community needs to engage with other stakeholders in this area here is the, the idea of creating this task force. 
and uh, which is a unique opportunity for us neurosurgeons for other specialists in this field in technological sector but above all for our patients so really i look forward to welcome uh, new participants to the platform and to the uh, task force and then we create a linkedin uh, profile where you, you can join us and we will share our knowledge our events on this platform thanks to all of you for being with us tonight Thank you very much, Enrico. You mentioned something very important. Regarding that, we are uh, looking for broadening of our network outside the neurosurgical society. We are inviting also, as I mentioned, engineers, people with completely different profile, but working on innovations that could be useful for neurosurgery and uh, will change probably the way we work in neurosurgery tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So. Uh, they are all welcome to become part of uh, this group and to give uh, their input uh, for uh, really changing the neurosurgery of tomorrow. And uh, now probably Nicolas, uh, one of the other founding members. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolai. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, with all our friends. I'm very happy to be here. And when you came with the idea, uh, you, Nicolai, I don't know if you remember, you came with the idea of finding some sort of organization that cover a place that wasn't covered by any of our other uh, committees and task forces that was dealing with uh, innovation and new technologies in neurosurgery. We, I think we are living in very special times that are challenging and also amazing. And I think that one of the key of this space is to be open to the possibility to other uh, disciplines uh, to join, for example, engineers and uh, computer scientists and all people that will make the future of neurosurgery together with us. I think that in this time, we should be both open to innovation and also critical because we owe an everyday uh, responsibility with our patient. We need to, uh, to be open for innovation, but um, we also need to provide the safety and uh, to critical review all the new um, technologies to be incorporated. So I'm very happy that we start with this amazing topic which is maybe a little bit out of the traditional uh, neurosurgical topics, but I think that it will show that uh, really start the, the way in which this task, task for is, uh, is uh, ready to be. So thank you very much. Very happy to be with you. Very excited to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicolas. So um, I'm <clears throat> really glad to... Yeah, that uh, we are looking exactly in different from purely neurosurgical topics, and I hope that it will be really interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, there are different uh, ways to join us. Uh, the first one that we have established is a group named ETIN uh, in LinkedIn, but we are uh, opening actually new uh, ways for people that want to join via uh, other social networks, and uh, uh, I hope how that will become a society of uh, really pe people with really different uh, type of, uh, of view over cer certain problems. Uh, now, before starting our uh, uh, giving the floor of our speaker, I would like to say that our first webinar is on the International Women's Day. I suppose that this should be a good sign. Uh, and I want to congratulate uh, all of you with uh, this day because uh, for me, um, this is... Um, how to say it, actually people that uh, work a lot, giving all from the, them uh, in our everyday uh, jobs uh, are very, very important for this uh, seminar. Uh, and I want to especially thanks to, to the ENS office. Really, thank you very much for all your efforts to make this happen. Uh, and um, now a few words about our speaker. Uh, I want to present you uh, Professor Kasabov. Professor Kasabov is a life fellow of the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, 
fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, fellow of the College of Fellows of International, Neural Network Society, and many others. He is founding uh, director of the Knowledge Engineering and Discovery Research Institute, professor of knowledge engineering at Oakland University and Technology. He has published over 700 works, 10 te textbooks, 28 patents and authorships, and certificates. He has also been included in Stanford University list of top 2% of scientists in the world by citation since 2020. Of course, this is only part of everything that Professor Casalo has done, so I will ask him to briefly introduce himself. Professor Casalo. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dabrowski. It is my pleasure to be to be here. As uh, uh, this is the first seminar on uh, uh, emergent uh, and uh, AI technologies for the area that is very important, neurosurgery, and I will try to be. Uh, uh, clear about what we can do and what uh, the future will be. Uh, my uh, background is uh, I, I was uh, born in Bulgaria, uh, studied in Bulgaria, and then I worked uh, uh, at the Technical University in Sofia. Now I am a visiting professor at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences on, on European projects related to, uh, to, to neurosurgery, indeed. And uh, I also worked in the, in the UK, uh, uh, in the past, now I'm in New Zealand, but I, of course, uh, I spent uh, time in Europe uh, working uh, in Zurich, working in, uh, with colleagues from Ulster, uh, and uh, uh, keeping in touch with uh, my colleagues all over the world. So I, it's my pleasure to, to give this uh, seminar. Of course, it will be a short, a brief introduction of some techniques that we develop uh, in my group. Thank you, uh, Professor Dabrowski. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I have to mention that actually you are in New Zealand, so you, we, we had to postpone a little bit uh, uh, the starting uh, of our um, the, the starting hour of our uh, webinar because it's uh, early morning in New Zealand. Actually, well, sun, sun yeah. is rising now. Okay. Sun is rising. It's not too early. Good morning, Professor Kasalov. And uh, before starting with. Um, uh, with um, your uh, speech, I would like to tell to the audience that if they have uh, an important part of these seminars will be the contact with the auditorium. So everyone is um, um, uh, everyone can ask a question in the question and ask and, and answer box and uh, or eventually in the chat. Uh, but the question and answer box is the main uh, way to ask a question. So please use the Q and A box that is on the bottom of your Zoom screen. This is the way where you, you can ask your questions. So thank you very much. I, I hope that all the audience will be active and we will have a lot of questions for uh, the, interest of, the interesting topic that Professor Kasavov will present. So Professor Kasavov, please, we can start with your speech. Uh, can, you see, can you see the screen now? Uh, no. Not yet, okay, so let me just... Uh... You... Okay. okay, you, can, you okay. can see the screen now. Thank you. Is that okay now? So you can see the screen, you can hear me. It's perfect, we hear you perfect. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to say that uh, uh, I decided to to accept this invitation by Professor Dabrowski, uh, talking about uh, a little bit uh, more broader view of the technologies. And the technologies start uh, with uh, neuroinformatics, uh, where data comes from, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, the, the artificial intelligence area uses this data to develop techniques like neural networks and to watch neural computers. And I also agreed to Professor uh, Dabrowski to include some applications in neurosurgery. I was not aware that uh, last year there were 20,000 papers published in AI in neurosurgery. I couldn't go through all of them. I'm sorry about this. But I still managed to, to capture some ideas, what is there and what needs to be developed in the future. And first of all, uh, congratulations to, to the group uh, and to the force. Uh, that is formed uh, by, by founders, 
and I found very uh, what what is important in the mission that uh, we can contribute to. Uh, the mission says that new emerging technologies and innovations in neurosurgeries are needed, and keywords uh, in this task force are robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Uh, emerging technologies, of course, it includes also data science. We feel that we can collaborate on these uh, topics. And I will go through some points uh, that will start with uh, why do we need artificial intelligence and what is neuroinformatics, what is neural networks, and then we will go to some applications in neurosurgery. Some of the points uh, I have made uh, and uh, in details in, in, in a book which is called Time Space, Spike in Your Networks and Brain Inspired Artificial Intelligence, published by Springer. I will leave my presentation with Professor Dabrowski so, and the uh, office uh, uh, of the task force or so anybody who is interested to have the copy, copy of, the, of the presentation, they will be very welcome. Uh, talking about artificial intelligence, uh, it actually goes into every area of, of technology and science. But the most beneficiary area is health care, according to the PwC Pricewaterhouse Cooper. And uh, health care will benefit a lot to several, several uh, points. Uh, one is personalization of health care. Uh, the other one is data available, uh, time saved, uh, and uh, utility available. So, uh, there are many, many uh, Many areas in healthcare uh, and healthcare can support the development of artificial intelligence and can benefit a lot from that. Uh, in terms of what kind of artificial intelligence techniques will be more important in the future, and there is also another diction that uh, uh, the so called deep learning techniques here will bring more benefit, more revenue to healthcare along with. Uh, with uh, machine learning, along with uh, computer vision, but deep learning. And deep learning now talk, it means neural networks, neural computers. And that is what I want to talk about. Uh, if we look at some publications uh, in uh, AI neurosurgery, I looked at two of them. Uh, there is, this, uh, of course, there are problems in neurosurgery that can benefit. From, from artificial intelligence, operative work, healthcare access, surgical procedures, post-operative follow-up research. Uh, and I have copied this from, from a publication by Mohammad Moffat uh, from uh, Oxford University. And if we look at the publications uh, in this area, we can see that uh, 2020, there were more than 20,000 publications uh, and uh, cumulatively 70,000 publications that in neurosurgery, they mention artificial intelligence, machine learning. So it's, it's something that uh, uh, we, can, we can address in the future. And uh, several papers that are uh, in neurosurgery papers commented on the benefits of artificial intelligence and also on the problems. Uh, one of the benefits, of course, uh, is that AI techniques may permit rapid and detailed analysis of the large quantities of clinical data, talking about diagnostics, decision-making prognostics. But there are some also perils, for example, faulty, inadequately trained or poorly understood algorithms may produce erroneous results, which may have wide-scale impact. But we have to be careful how to use uh, artificial intelligence. And one of the papers uh, uh, published uh, also recently uh, has the following motto, create a model that is as sophisticated as the problem requires, but not more so. so we have to be careful not to overdo this as well. So not too simple models, but not too complex models that can be developed to serve the, the purpose. And uh, talking about uh, neuroinformatics, neuroinformatics is the area where data is collected and uh, in, in, in uh, neuroscience and neurological data is plenty different types of data. We talk about 
uh, DTI, we talked about uh, fMRI, we talked about EEG data, we talked about brain scans. So how do we deal with this enormous amount of data to create a model that can help people understand and use these models in practice? Uh, neuroinformatics has challenges uh, such as we need to look at improved quality of data, multiple modality. How do we put so many modalities together for a better diagnosis and prognosis? Different types of data. We have vacuum based, we have longitudinal data over time. Efficient learning from data, adaptive, predictive, personalized modeling. This is, of course, a key issue now to have a personalized models for everybody other than one model for everybody uh, in the world. In explainability, no more hypothesis, please, as we say. Let's help our systems to explain what they have done and how they have done that, so we can understand better uh, what is the, what is the, the issue. And uh, of course, uh, neural networks are one of the, it's only one technique that can help in this respect. Uh, neural networks are inspired by some principles of the human brain with long history from 43 uh, to now. And neural networks are computational models that can take uh, input data as, and they, they, they produce an output. And uh, the, the type of neural neurons that we use in neural networks can vary from very uh, kind of uh, uh, not so adequate to brain data and more adequate to brain data. And uh, uh, this is also a development in neural networks from the first generation of frozen blood to the second generation of the uh, multi receptor and now to the third generation of spiking neural networks. But uh, early neural networks, they, have, they had no adaptability, no explainability. They were black box. They were criticized a lot. And that is why uh, we needed to develop new techniques that would be more appropriate for, uh, for, for the data. And new techniques were also inspired by the human brain. Uh, for example, the early deep neural networks developed by Fukushima were inspired by the visual cortex, how the visual cortex uh, recognizes objects. Deep convolutional neural networks are now the state of the art. Uh, and deep convolutional neural networks means that we have uh, many layers of neurons that uh, uh, that take an image and recognize recognize the image. Unfortunately, the current deep neural networks are excellent for vector frame based data. This is fortunate, of course, but not so for spatial temporal data and computer vision for video data. There is no kind of asynchronous events learned in the model difficult to adapt to new data and the structure is not explainable. So explainability is very important to have in the computational models. And there were some models that were developed to explain uh, to, to, to explain what they have done, how they have done from the data, and to extract the essence of the data in terms of rules. And these are the so-called fuzzy neural networks. Some of them are uh, well-developed, well-used in practice. So we can say that. Uh, uh, knowledge can be extracted from data rather than having a black box now. Uh, it's about also inspiration from the brain as the new generation of the uh, computational intelligence of artificial intelligence. Yeah, we, we the scientists, we look at the human brain as the most sophisticated product of the evolution. It's a lifelong learning system for knowledge re representation and knowledge transfer. And we talk about different types of memory, short-term, long-term, genetic, different types of data, different scales of data processes, nanoseconds, milliseconds, minutes, hours, many years. And knowledge is represented as deep spatial temporal pattern that evolves adapt over time. For example, this is the pattern when a person sees an object with the visual cortex activation, and then the person is grasping the object with the activity of the motor cortex. Maybe the, the person can have a cup of coffee as well. Anyway, so the challenges of artificial intelligence is 
how do we adopt, how do we develop, adopt some principles from the human brain, develop the artificial intelligence systems so they can serve better the clinicians, the practice in health and in neurosurgery in particular. One development, recent development is called spike neural networks and spike neural networks are uh, are uh, use use a different type of information than traditional neural networks are using scalars or numbers. Spiking neural networks represent information as a binary unit spikes over time. So time is represented in the data in the in the model, and time is definitely and space is represented in the in the in the brain functions. So if we don't have time, we may not be able to understand what the model does. Uh, over time and as a dynamic uh, model. So spike in neural networks, uh, this is a neuron, spike in neuron that takes inputs as, as spikes, trains to be activated when a threshold is reached and to emit a spike. Spike in neural networks has been developed in the last 15 years or so, different types of spike in neural networks. And they, the, the beauty of them is that uh, they can they represent spatial temporal data and they can think higher level function, like frequency, like rate, to do low level uh, genetics. And uh, they have also inspired the development of brain inspired computation algorithms and the creation of neural computers. And uh, talking about brain modeling and brain inspired systems, we should make a, make a difference. Uh, there, there are brain modeling systems that are uh, focused on detailed analysis of brain functions and their computational modeling, like the Horizon Blue Brain project and the Virtual Brain, which is a very, very strong project, very strong uh, research. But the other side is brain-inspired data analytics, using brain principles to build models of brain data that can be used to understand brain functions. And this is the sort of reverse engineering approach. And uh, I will talk about this reverse engineering approach more specifically as one system developed in my group. And this system is called NewTube. Uh, and NewTube is a, is a three dimensional structure uh, that uh, uses a brain template to allocate neurons uh, uh, representing different brain areas. So we can make a brain template in this group and this model. And in this is we can learn, this model can learn from the data that is available, including genetic data or temporal data, of course, and spatial temporal data. And this model can be analyzed to produce an out output like predicting, uh, predicting uh, signals, brain signals, or classification uh, of, of, of brain states. Uh, there are different stages in the development of such models that are based on spike neural networks. One stage is how do we encode uh, continuous value data into spikes, and uh, there are some principles used as from silicon retina as a threshold base uh, in Turif in the in Institute for Neuroinformatics, or cochlear-based information uh, data that is a continuous data encoded into spikes using the so-called cochlear drugs. Once data is encoded, it can be used in, uh, to, to train spiking neurons in spiking neural networks. And we can use different types of such spiking neurons. How do we train a system using spiking neurons? Uh, one of the methods is called uh, spike time dependent plasticity. And definitely, uh, this is the extension of the Hebbian learning rule in neural networks. And the extension is with the in inclusion of time. So time is important when one neuron spikes and another one spikes after that. That is a long-term potentiation. If that happens many times, that may show some causality. Uh, otherwise, it is long-term depression. So time is learned in spike in neural networks to change the, the efficacy of the connection weights. Uh, and that is a significant departure from traditional neural networks like multilayer perceptron. And uh, some of the papers in neurosurgery, uh, AI neurosurgery, they, uh, they said, well, our models are not good enough. And I should say that 
uh, they haven't been developed to, for for you uh, to to use in uh, in situation where you have uh, special temporal data. They have been developed for some other statistical methods. So we have to look at new methods. And uh, spiking neurons, spiking neural networks can also be trained in the so-called supervised learning mode to pre to to react to to emit an output signal when particular pattern pattern is presented. That is called supervised learning. Uh, so we can make a neuron spike earlier the way we perceive objects and we react uh, to avoid collision or to avoid some unfortunate situations. We predict the output of our neurons uh, and the, the, the neurons predict their, their signals and they can react accordingly. Uh, this new uh, system is uh, uh, trained from data, as I said, sequence of five sequences after encoding of the data. And uh, this data is entered into located, spatially located neurons and the uh, learning in the tube is spike time dependent plasticity, creating connections, changing connections. So that's a pattern is formed from the data, and this pattern is recognized in certain output. And here's one video. How can you see the video, please? So you can see the video. Uh, so that is how the, the system evolves over time. And uh, if we have this simulator, and we do have this simulator, we can observe what areas uh, is more connected, means that all data is coming. To, it could be EEG data, could be fMRI, changing the connection weight, so we can observe that. This is not a black box anymore. And examples could be from different uh, EEG data that we have continuous training of this tube over time and the tube develops its connections. And most importantly, we can trace the activity of this tube when the new data is centered, similar to what I showed, uh, how the brain learns to create a trajectory of when the person is seeing an object and grasping an object. So we can explain the, 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 the patterns in this model that reflect terms of activity, the data back to the human brain as a reverse engineering. We can extract the important dynamic information. Dynamic information of means that how many times certain areas of the brain are presented by these channels, if you like the EEG channels, how much they exchange information between those spikes here. And this dynamic model will tell us what are the important areas of uh, uh, represented in the data that are more important for this state of the brain? So this is no more a black box. We can extract information. We can extract rules saying if this area is activated first, and then this area, another area is activated second, etc. And this is the output that is recorded, and we can understand why this output or could be state, or could be classified, classificational, why this output was presented. And uh, based on these uh, uh, algorithms, uh, my, my group has developed one environment that can be used and that can be downloaded free. It's called YouTube, and here's the website. But this environment can, can be used to develop applications, uh, different applications on, on brain data and other spatial temporal data using some of the so-called neural computers or not using neural computers because we can say that such spiking neural networks can be systems once developed as a model, once proved and uh, validated, it can be implemented uh, on the von Neumann architecture. This is John von Neumann and the first digital computer was developed by, by Jonathan Nassau. Or these algorithms can be implemented on neuromorphic uh, uh, computers, uh, where instead of bits, neuromorphic computers use bits at times, so spikes. Or quantum computers, where the computers use the so-called bits rather than bits or spikes. 
and the hardware systems or neural computers are being developed uh, very, very intensively. Started from Carver Mead in '89, and now we have uh, the Spinator system uh, in Manchester, led by by Steve Huber. We have chips, fighting neural network chips by Giacomo in Divery in Zurich and the Retail Brook at the True North uh, by the Armandro Motor in IBM and the, the new one, which is called uh, uh, Logia uh, by Intel. Now, talking about applications, we can look at different applications of such techniques, some of them very much relevant to neurosurgery. And talking about brain data, we can, we can use uh, uh, fMRI data, EEG data, and I'll show some examples of how that can be done uh, using steps of encoding information, learning this information encoded into, into a model, properly created, and then analyzing this model in terms of activities to go back to understanding what the brain is doing, and that is the reverse engineering I'm talking about. One application, one uh, particular application is called brain uh, machine interfaces. Brain machine interfaces are when people use their brain signals to control some robots. Uh, and here is uh, one of my students, Stefan Klebs from Germany, who, uh, who controlled this robot to move with his brain signals. Of course, we need a system that learns uh, the signals from Stefan uh, and emits signals to control the robot. Uh, and uh, we, we can also talk about the grasp and lift, uh, uh, the kind of task we can follow what. Uh, the, 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 the model has learned from the data. And we can compare the activities of the different areas of the, the model. We can compare it with the, with the information, the knowledge of people do that from neuroscience. And we can see that uh, rules can be extracted from this model to tell us what the person is doing. And this is also, uh, also published uh, as a neuro rehabilitation uh, method in uh, scientific reports where we have EEG data collected, we have model created all the time, and then uh, it's an imaginary movement of, of prosthetics. One of the projects that I'd like to mention here is the, in brain machine interfaces is uh, a project that was funded by the European Union, European Commission, uh, and it is called NEMO BMI, um, Neuromorphics uh, BMI, uh, and it is from the Horizon uh, Europe, uh, with, with the participation of uh, colleagues from France, uh, CEA, Grenoble, the Netherlands, a company very important uh, uh, research in, uh, in neurorehabilitation called Onward, Switzerland, EPFL, and Bulgaria, Information uh, Institute for Information and Communication Technologies. Uh, and this uh, is uh, our uh, our job here. Uh, the main the main purpose is uh, to decode signals from the brain, and use these signals to move prosthesis, or and to recover uh, damaged brain nerves. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the brain nerves in spinal cord that could be recovered based on brain signals. This is just a starting point. And here's my, our team in the Institute for um, Information Communication Technologies in Bulgaria uh, with a co-lead uh, by Professor Kuprinkova. And uh, I would like to say to everybody who is participating in this seminar, um, uh, every, every uh, woman, uh, congratulations with the 8th of March, the International Women's Day. Uh, and it is very, uh, important to, to have our colleagues uh, to join us uh, and to work with us. Thank you. Uh, in virtual reality, we can, uh, we can observe how people, when they recover from stroke through the virtual reality, artificial hands movement uh, of the virtual hand, we can see, uh, we, can also, we can also measure how the brain is working, how the brain is improving. Uh, what Part of the brain is developing in an online mode. We can also observe how people control objects or how people navigate, and we can understand better what they do. Uh, of course, there's some also some interesting research that uh, uh, we have done 
uh, with a group from the University of Otago uh, called Cyber Sickness. And uh, the recent papers in uh, one journal, which is called Gain Informatics, uh, we published uh, a research that shows that uh, uh, with 85% accuracy, uh, we can predict whether a person will have a cyber sickness or not, even before they experience this, uh, uh, the, this situation. Only in a resting state, analyzing the brain data can be used to predict whether a person will have a cyber sickness or not. Uh, personalized modeling it is something that we developed as uh, in, in introducing both personal data and dynamic brain data to create a model for a person. And if we create a model for a person, individual, the accuracy of prediction uh, of, 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 of the outcome is much higher than if we just use one model, regression, or even a neural network for everybody anywhere in the world. And this personalized modeling is something that we, we will develop in the future. Personalized modeling is also used in many other applications uh, like uh, longitudinal MRI data to predict uh, dementia or onset of uh, Alzheimer's disease using a large cohort of data and building building uh, a model for every person and testing the model on this person. Also publication in neural networks. Uh, we can also develop uh, different structures of brain inspired spike in neural networks uh, that we can structure them according to one personal MRI uh, scan. And we made this model a personalized model. And this personalized model can be used in different uh, different applications like predicting the effect of mindfulness, how mindfulness uh, changes the, the brain, uh, predicting uh, uh, or classification of some um, uh, comprehension uh, using fMRI data or merging fMRI and DTI data together. And that is also very important to develop new methods for integrating space, time, and direction. Meeting stroke occurrence a few hours ahead, it's also uh, possible using some both uh, uh, personalized and environmental data that trigger uh, the stroke. Using personalized modeling in different areas show much better results than traditional methods like the perpetual machine, multi-lab perceptrons, uh, and this is not uh, incidental because we use uh, spatial temporal data. As discussions, I would say that uh, the approach that we take now with the brain inspired spike in neural networks developed for particular application Taylor uh, has lots of advantages. And I have discussed this uh, in, in this book, Time Space, Spike in Neural Network, Brain Inspired Artificial Intelligence. And also, there is uh, quite a lot of discussions on, uh, on these issues in the so called uh, Sprinter Handbook of Bio. Neuroinformatics also published uh, by Springer. Problem is that, of course, we have to deal with lots of parameters. Next stage is to introduce genetic along with neuronal data to work to have a better model uh, for, for a person integrated, integrating different modalities like fMRI and EEG data that are in different times and uh, uh, spatial scales. It's important, and I would like to finish my presentation uh, following the instructions uh, by Professor Dobrovsky that, uh, of course, we have to be careful with time uh, in the evening time. Uh, we, we have just formed a new uh, group which is called NPG uh, for Neuroinformatics, Neural Networks and Neurocomputers. Here is our website, uh, and we have uh, seminars. We will have also some, uh, some uh, and we definitely would like to keep it uh, multidisciplinary, where we have people from from neuroscience, we have people from computational computational uh, intelligence, uh, we have people from engineering. So this is very much interdisciplinary group that uh, we have formed, and we will have uh, uh, we will have uh, seminars together for the future. Thank you very much indeed, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Kasabov. Uh, it was a very interesting speech. 
uh, we had some problems with audio from time to time to time, but this is another proof that you are talking from very far. Uh, but I hope that uh, we could get most of uh, this interesting uh, information. For me, one of the very important messages was that um, if I uh, had uh, well understood that um, with this type of um, te neural networks, uh, they do not represent black box anymore. So I think that this was one of the very important concerns regarding network, uh, neural networks that we don't know what exactly is happening inside them. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for this interesting information. Thank now, you. any questions? Any questions? I have to check our Q&A. Yeah, uh, Nikolai, I have a couple of questions, if I yeah. may. Please, please, Nikolai. So I uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Casavo. I enjoy, despite of the low quality of the of the sound, I enjoy your your presentation very much. So I have, first of all, a very simple question, and which is in which sense the neural network are similar and in which sense they are different to the real neural network, the wet, the one that we see uh, every day in the operating room? Yeah, yeah. Well, the answer is uh, uh, there is no, no one neural network artificial neural networks. There are many types of neural networks that uh, have differences <coughs> with the real ones uh, to different extents. So we can have neurons that uh, fully imitate biological neurons if we need that. And we have neurons that are more data uh, oriented for capturing data patterns. So I think this is a continuous of, uh, and this uh, from, from the from the beginning of uh, the neural network area, and it continues uh, in the future. And uh, we can see that more and more biologically plausible neural models are created. The question is, uh, do we need complexity? We need complexity as much as it serves our models. And if we have data, we have to use the proper uh, uh, neurons and neural types. For example, for temporal data, we can use spike in your networks much better. But for vector-based data, we can use some uh, multilayer person probes still, or deep neural networks with uh, different types of neurons that are not spiking neurons. So I think we have to choose which ones uh, uh, fits better the purpose of the, of, the, of the study. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there is a question that is maybe a little bit specialized for some, but it's regarding what you mentioned about the explanation. I mean, yeah. you know, in the, the neural, uh, neural network, as I understand, is a kind of a box with a very complex uh, computer next that you put it on, into a big set of data, you fit the network, and you get an outcome. And what what do you really mean with explanation? Are you meaning explanation of what, about things in the real world? For example, we can ask a computer to explain how something works, or you mean it's just explaining what it did to get to the conclusion? Well, I, I would go back to. Aristotle from, 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 of course, the, the, the known philosopher who studied data, who studied data to extract rules. And some of his rules were not correct. They were updated, of course, later. Now we have tools to uh, take the data, learn from data and extract some knowledge, extract some rules that can be used by the users. Uh, and talking about brain data, brain data, so most of the brain is spatial temporal. If we don't have proper tools, proper methods, uh, AI methods, we won't be able to understand the dynamics of the, the, the brain functioning. And that is where spiking neural networks can be used to learn the spatial temporal patterns. And we can extract these patterns. We can visualize them. We can visualize them even in online. We can see how the paralyzed person uh, is, is, is learning to, to move a hand and, and, and to, 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 to move in a, in, a, in a space so we can see that. 
this is the explanation ability of, of the neural networks that we would like to, and we are developing. And I am against the black box and everybody, uh, I would say in the United States and Europe, uh, they say no more black boxes, please. Uh, and this should be the case. Now we have to move to open boxes and understanding uh, from our model, what the brain is doing in that so-called reverse engineering. Thank you for the questions. Very much, very much hot topics at the moment, yes. Thank you yeah, very we much. We are really looking forward to understand what is happening <laughs> in there. And um, sorry, Nikolai, for uh, I interrupt you. I ask a question. It's, we are, all of us, we are for the last few months talking about chat GPT. So this is a topic that uh, uh, not simply is promising, uh, but it's really prom uh, but um, uh, it's really something that has completely changed our view about artificial intelligence. If this is correct, to name it like this, and we saw some applications that uh, for a few months uh, has shown uh, results that are not simply impressive, but really will change the day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we will change completely not only the way we interact with um, with the machines, but also uh, a lot of professions will probably disappear or will at least change. What do you think about ChatGPT and such type of artificial intelligence uh, constructs? Well, if uh, ChatGPT just does in one sentence, uh, this is only one system that is a language model, uh, and there will be many more uh, now being developed. Uh, and especially in China, we will see several, several uh, very high tech. Uh, GTP is a common common use. I wouldn't recommend it for experts because uh, the, the information GPT uses is uh, generally information available everywhere, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, peer reviewed for expert as, as an expert knowledge. And also the point is that uh, uh, new information can be added by anybody uh, because Chat GDP asks you uh, what is your ideal answer, and you can you can and people can answer uh, fake information. So so Chat GPT is good uh, as a starting point as a language model. I wouldn't recommend it for experts. Okay, thank you. But um, if we look a little bit in the future, the Chat GPT appeared for the general public. For a few months, probably you had uh, you had you you had knowledge about it for long years. But for the general public, it has become a star. I would say for a few months. And if things change so fast, what can we expect? Let's say in a few months more, or in a year, or in two years, if we have such an ex exponential growth, what do you think will happen? Do you think that this advice not for professionals will remain uh, relevant for a long time? Well, I would say that it's good for, for the public uh, to it, it, extend their knowledge, a uh, general knowledge, uh, with, with, with a with a careful careful uh, consideration, uh, because some of this knowledge may be true, may may not be true, and it uh, it is of course if you go to 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 uh, perform an operation, I think you better look at the. Uh, the the professional publications and the peer reviewed publications and if if you want to 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 have new knowledge but for the general public it will increase i think the iq uh, of the of the whole of the whole uh, of the whole planet <laughs> the population in the planet uh, definitely it will improve the iq of the general general public thank you nikolai we have a question regarding the brain machine interfaces if i may so, yes. Professor, uh, it's a very promising technology for us that we have to deal, for example, with uh, spinal cord lesions. Uh, usually young patient uh, paralyzed uh, for the rest of their life with current technology as it is a really a hope for all those patients and, uh, and uh, we are waiting a lot from that. So the question is, um, where, is where is the most uh, challenging problem? Is it the, the actual brain machine interface? So how to read 
the information that the brain is processing? Is it how we do next in the neural network? Or is it the connection of that with the effector? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Let me say that this research question is the main question we have to answer in this project, which is called ne NEMO BMI. And maybe if, if I gave if I give another seminar in two, two years time, I may be able to answer this question because it is the research that we are doing at the moment, but wonderful indeed. Is it the, the problem in, in brain signals? Is it the problem in our detect, uh, detecting the brain signals? Is, is it the problem of, of, of control feedback? And how is feedback used to improve this? This is something that we are working on. Thank you for the question. Okay, so we are close to the end of our first webinar. Uh, we don't have time for uh, more uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kasabov, for uh, presenting this very interesting lecture and talking about such uh, interesting topics. Uh, it was a pleasure for us. And uh, thank you for using a language that, was, uh, uh, that we, as general public, as uh, neurosurgeons, uh, was comprehensible for us. I think that this is a very important step um, uh, for us to use this common language that will permit us as neurosurgeon to explain what are our problems and, and for you as scientists to find a way to resolve them, hopefully. Uh, I would like to everyone that has been part of this webinar tonight, uh, to all the founding mem members that could join and also for those that couldn't join because uh, they are still working as I found uh, as far as I receive uh, some messages. Uh, thanks very much to the Office of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies uh, that uh, facilitated this process and made it possible. Thank you, Andreas, also for joining. And I hope that this was a very good first step. Uh, and now our next webinar will be in two months. Uh, you will receive additional information. Uh, please be active, uh, join the LinkedIn group and uh, stay in for, we're going to be informed for the, uh, the the other options for joining the ETIN uh, task force. Uh, so I wish you a wonderful evening and uh, till very, very soon, I hope. I would say thank you very much, uh, Professor Dobrowski. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I will finish uh, this, my presentation with apologies that I, I see 39 questions in the chat, chat room. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was not is. able to ask these questions. I'm happy if you send these questions to me uh, on the email uh, and uh, I will have the presentation with Professor Dabrowski as a PDF file. Let's, let's start now to communicate on these issues and uh, addressing these questions that you have, uh, we have in the chat. Um, Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you once again. I hope that this was our first meeting. Thank you very much and good evening to all of you. Bye. The best. Bye bye. bye, -bye.